everybody, and welcome to this next episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where we have an interview today, an interview with N.P. Hunt, poet, and we will talk about N.P. Hunt's book, Immortalize in Ink. But first, I want to say, you know how a lot of times I tell you guys, hey, if you want to see the video version of this um, podcast, you need to join so you can see the video version. I'm not going to fucking push that on you today. Because through um, the problems of the internet, the video, even though when we were talking on Zoom, I could see him. For some reason, on the recording of said video, he's not there. It's me in a black box. And so, considering an interview, the interviewee ends up talking a lot. Most of the video is me going like this. So, for those of you listening, you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. But for those of you who are about to watch this, um, my members on YouTube... This this might be a horrible watch, but I figured I would give it to you anyway since you like looking at the fucking money maker right here. Jesus Christ. So, in other news, it's World Cup and um, people have been getting drunk 24 hours a day in their football jerseys so they could watch people kick a ball. And last night these two guys were trying to walk a third guy up the hill here, and I mentioned this in another video briefly, um, it was a fucking shit show. It took them probably an hour and a half to get from that telephone pole to this light pole. And um, the dude fell really hard, um, face first into the side of this truck, and then fell in the gutter, and then somehow rolled under the truck. And his friends could not get him out from under the truck. It took forever. And when they finally got him, they were, like, yanking on him so hard. I thought they were pulling, like, a fucking sleeping bag out from under the fucking truck. No, it was a dude. And then they were trying to walk him, and he was getting all pissed off and, like, pushing people away and all this stuff. And he fucking took a header into a bush and went right over it. It was fucking awesome. Good shit. Good shit all over the place. I love watching people fall down. Um, what they ended up having to do finally, cause it was funny because like there were two guys and then this drunk guy that could not fucking walk, but they also had one of those big, like 30 pack cases of beer. And so they were trying to hold the beer and trying to like walk their friend. And, um, it just was not happening. And at one point, one guy was turned one way holding an arm like this and the other guy was turned the other way holding the arm like that and holding the beer and they tried to walk and they went in a circle because um, they, they had no idea what the fuck to do. It was fucking hysterical. Good shit. So finally what they ended up doing, one of the dudes went behind the guy and like put their arms around his waist like this and was like walking him up the rest of the hill. <laughs> Good shit, dude. Good shit. Love it, love it, love it. Anyway, let's talk about what's going on here on... Oh, shit, I had emails. We'll skip the emails for an episode where we don't have an interview. Now, make sure to rate and review this show with five stars over on iTunes. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, click that fucking thumb, dude. Hit the fucking subscribe button. Share this shit. You know you want to. It's the right thing to do. Let's all be nice, good, friendly viewers slash listeners here. First, we gotta do the motherfucking shoutouts. All right. So, I want to give a big thank you to my folks over on Patreon. Michael, Cedar, Harry, thank you so much for supporting me over there. And then for the people who were in the YouTube crew, we have Patrick, AM, Alan. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate the fuck out of you guys. Let me know if there's anything I can do to make your lives fucking better. And now, for the big swinging dicks over at the Anarchy Crew, we have, thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, to Josh, 
to Jessica, to Shaylin, and an even bigger swinging dick. Somebody in the chat book of the month club, let's give a big thank you, because I don't know if you want me using your name yet or not, so we will just say it like this. Stardust Grizzle Poet, thank you for being so fucking awesome that I am just at a loss for words. You are the shit. Thank you. But And if you want me to use your name instead of the Stardust thing, you just fucking let me know. Again, I will have a link to N.P. Hunt's book down below if you would like to pick it up. I'm trying to think if there's... An, you know what? L let's just... Um, save all that shit for the butt plugs and get right into this goddamn thing with NP Hunt. Before we get too far into your book here, can you tell us a little um, how you got into writing and how you ended up in poetry? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, I'd always quite enjoyed reading poetry, even from being quite young. Like, for example, even at primary school, there was a, a there was a, a waiting list for people to get hold of uh, Shel Silverstein's Where the Sidewalk Ends. So you had to get on this waiting list and then eventually you'd get a copy of the book. And then I remember reading it at my, uh, my grandparents' house when uh, they used to pick us up sometimes from school. So I remember reading it there and... Um, yeah, like I've so I've always loved Chelsea Silverstein. When I got a bit older, I started reading a lot of Edgar Allan Poe, both the short stories and the poetry. Um, I sort of ended up drifting away from it for a while, uh, although I did like um, Spike Milligan and people like that as well. When I was towards the end of primary school, my our head teacher covered a couple of lessons, and instead of teaching us the regular curriculum he decided that he was just going to start reading us Sherlock Holmes stories um he read us the speckled band and I was just like wow like this is this is this is for me uh so I got really into Sir Arthur Conan Doyle then H.G. Wells uh people like that Jules Verne uh been a voracious reader ever since I, I used to write uh mainly I used to write a lot of poetry but like in the form of so song lyrics yeah. um and then beyond that, like I just I, I, I kind of drift in and out of reading poetry. And I, I, it was something that I always used to come back to writing and stuff because it just seemed to be something that I felt naturally compelled to do sort of thing. I'd sort of drifted away from writing pretty much completely um, by the time I was in my late 20s. Uh, and then a friend of mine um, got in touch with me because I was having quite a hard time with mental health and uh, he'd actually gone online and found a website that was recruiting people to do articles about pro wrestling uh, and he was like he must sent me this message saying you know like writing is always something that seems to have helped you with your mental health this site is looking for people to do this and um he was just like, well, you know, I, I don't know anyone like yourself who's like got this encyclopedic knowledge of pro wrestling. Uh, and it's just kind of going to waste. So look into doing it. So I signed up, started writing for them, uh, got poached by a couple of different other websites, then started writing for a magazine, then started getting invited to a load of events for like the British Wrestlers Reunion and stuff for the people who used to work, who used to wrestle on ITV World of Sport. Yeah. So talking to people like Marty Jones and Johnny Saint and um, a lot of people who were working the British Indies around that time and stuff. It was really interesting. And then, like I said, I was writing for the magazine. So I was interviewing people from TNA, getting tickets to the TNA shows for free, all that kind of stuff. The whole thing got really stressful. But all, all, the whole time I was doing that, I was still writing poetry and writing a few short stories. Basically, like the the whole the whole wrestling thing kind of fell away. And I've just been writing uh, poetry and short stories and stuff like that since. So uh, that's a bit of a long answer, but yeah, that, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> like there's so much I want to fucking grab in on that. But first off, where are you where are you located? Where are you from? So I'm from Manchester uh, in the UK. I currently live in a town called Oldham, which is um, just outside of. Greater Manchester, but I'm actually from Derbyshire, 
So I'm from a town called Glossop, which is like halfway between Manchester and Sheffield. You basically like there isn't a really a way to get from Manchester to Sheffield without going through Glossop and going on this road called the Snake Pass. A uh, drummer from Def Leppard, I think it was, lost his uh, arm on the oh, shit. on the on the Snake Pass because it's just this proper little winding road thing. Yeah, uh, that goes through the hills. But other than the fact that you have to go through it, it's it's one of those places where it's like, well, you, you, you might have to go through, but for God's sake, don't stop. Like it's a thirty five years behind the times cobbled streets sort of. Yeah, yeah. I I, I don't want to I don't want to slag it off too much because people from there might be watching. But like the uh, but yeah, I, I'm not I'm not Glossop's biggest fan. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> So now, as far as you saying that when you were writing poetry early on, it was kind of more like song lyrics kind of thing. Yeah. What, kind of, what kind of music are you into? Like what kind of, what what influences musically were you getting to write your poems at that point? Um, okay. So, well, the, the initially sort of classical rock music like Queen, mm-hmm. uh, Queen, Meatloaf, that kind of thing. So that's what I kind of sort of grew up with. Then I started getting into grunge and heavy metal. I was at the right age where when Slipknot came out, I was um, 16 and going to college. So getting into new metal because that was what was coming out at that time. Yeah. So yeah, you know, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot and uh, Korn and everything like that. Were you like um, angsty enough for it too? Like, oh yeah, definitely, yeah. I seem to have got into that sort of mindset before I discovered the music almost. Uh, I was very sort of uh, angsty and a bit sort of angry at the world and stuff because um, uh, from being about 14, I guess. And then when I started discovering that kind of music, I was like, yeah, this this is for me. But I also really like stuff like R.E.M. and um, Idlewild. I don't know if you know who they are. They're a Scottish yeah, yeah. band. <laughs> Lyrically... Lyric wise, I tend to go for bands like Idlewild, REM, uh, Airborne Toxic Event, uh, Granddaddy, uh, Pink Floyd, that kind of thing. Yeah. I find that they're like very lyrically brilliant. Obviously, you get the stuff that's like um, Slipknot and Corn and that kind of thing, Marilyn Manson, where it's like obviously a completely different side, but equally, you know, uh, lyrically very sound sort of thing. So, yeah. Like, um, like if we could talk about Marilyn Manson for a hot minute here, especially mechanical animals, but like right. he was putting together some of the best fucking concept albums. Ever, Absolutely. I thought like Antichrist Superstar, um, mechanical animals and, um, Hollywood. Yeah. Those fucking things, dude, like from front to back, I, I was like blown away. Because, like, I, as far as concept albums go, like, I thought, like, the two best concept albums ever were fucking um, Ziggy Stardust and the Spires from Mars or um, Willie Nelson's Redheaded Stranger. And right. I'm like, these, yeah. these are the best. These are the best. Nothing can touch these. And um, Mechanical Animals, dude, that fucking knocked me out. I couldn't fucking believe how much story was in the whole fucking thing. Absolutely, and, yeah. That just blew me away. That made me a huge fan of his. Because, like, when I first heard the music, I was like, mm, well, whatever. You know, no big deal. And the whole shock factor of everything, it was like, eh, it's been done, but whatever, it's fine. Yeah, you kind of think, like, well, you know, if you're just be trying to be the Howard Stern of rock, then fair enough, you, you're doing it right. But, the, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, um, I, I sort of got into Marilyn Manson, um, sort of by accident it was more like i went into a little uh record shop in glossop and um i was picking up all the nirvana albums and everything and uh looking at a few of the uh other rock things and then the guy who was working there was like um have you tried listening to antichrist superstar and mechanical animals and i was like um no i mean I've, i think i've heard like one or two you know yeah. but nothing that's really kind of grabbed me. He was like, no, listen to them as albums. You'll, I think you'll like them. So I, like, them seriously, and I, honestly, I, hated, yeah. I hated dope show when I heard it, I'm like, this song yeah. is fucking stupid. But when you hear it with the whole album, 
it like totally works and you're like jesus fucking christ dude um and, and, and rock is dead what a great song oh you know but yeah like uh both of those albums absolutely fantastic like you say as as full albums uh maybe not necessarily something that you'd go through and go like picking singles from as such um there are really good catchy songs on there but like just when you said rock is dead i got goosebumps all down my legs dude that's so funny <laughs> no it's just it's crazy because like i don't know if a lot of people understand like how much like manchester has actually fucking shaped music like you have fucking venom you have the smiths you have fucking like joy division like there are so many great fucking bands that fucking came out of fucking manchester or this like surrounding area right there that um, i mean yeah i mean we've got to apologize for oasis but the, apart from that then <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, we've done we've, we've done pretty well. <laughs> Primal Scream, you know, like <laughs> like so. You started writing for um, wrestling magazines and stuff. As far as that goes, like, do you have like like Hemingway, for instance? A lot of people think Hemingway found his style with writing because he was doing journalism for so long or whatever. Right. So, do you feel like? writing for um the wrestling magazines like helped you in the style you have um i'd probably say not um i think being a fan of pro wrestling it potentially because of promo styles and things like that uh but not really the actual uh journalism side of it i think that that was more got me into more of a sort of regimented attitude towards writing where it was you know getting words down on the page and um editing and things like that but not the style overall i wouldn't have said no so your book um immortalized in ink the book is very like were you into like did you read like the melancholy death of oyster boy and shit like that yeah yeah i've got that yeah oh uh, that's so fucking good i love it so um good. but yeah the, it's like the the um the stuff that i really like reading is stuff like that i, I mean i still love reading shell silverstein i brought him up earlier but you know, like, it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, obviously people dismiss that as being for kids. Mm -hmm. and But there's so much depth to it. And yeah. it's and it, it's dark and it's fun. And I, I like both those things. So um, I, and I like poetry that's sort of a bit on the musical sort of side. So I do I do still love stuff that that rhymes and has and stuff like that. The other feel, and a, I think a lot of it has to do with the artwork on it, but like you, you got some great art in this book mm. and it's very like Edward Gorey feeling like with. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that I said that was um, when, cause uh, it was a friend of mine who offered to sort of put the book together. So she used to work for a couple of, um, different publishers in London. She worked for DK and I think she worked for Penguin at one point. Uh, she's called Rhea Fand. <laughs> it's a, uh, she, she got like, her, her real name is Rhea, but yeah, she, um, she was doing roller derby at one point. Nice. So um, obviously everyone has those sort of pun violent names, don't they? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, she was doing, when she was doing roller derby, she took the name Rhea Fand. And um, and she's, she still uses that now as her uh, professional name for doing graphic design and things like that. So um, she was putting it together. She got in touch with a couple of artists. Um, and one of the things that I said was that if I, you know, if I was going to have artwork in there, that I'd want it to be sort of like uh, Edward Gorey, the sort of um, stuff like uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah, for real. Which is terrifying. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Terrifying. So I was like, if you can get some stuff that's a bit like that, then yeah, definitely uh, that, that's the kind of stuff that I'd want in there. I don't want it just to be like little crappy line drawings like Rupi Kaur. I, you know, I, I want it to be something a bit more substantial, but I, I, you know, 
so the, the people who contributed to it, uh, Andy Hosegood and Coral Davis. Uh, Coral, I think, does uh, tattoo design, and uh, Andy Hosegood does uh, sort of pin-up art, usually. Um, but uh, obviously, as soon as he was like, oh, well, so I get to draw some stuff like Edward Gorey, and he threw himself into that, and he just absolutely loved it. And he was, yeah, so he uh, he ended up doing a couple more drawings for the book, even after we'd uh, essentially finalized everything. He was like, I've, I've got a couple more here. Yeah, the art in it, it adds so much to your stuff. It's not just the art, but how you lay your poems out on the page and how different mm. they are each time. What what inspires you to lay them out? The, does that happen when you're writing or does that happen afterwards when you're putting the book together? Uh, for, for a lot of that, it definitely happened afterwards. Um, so when I'm, when I'm first writing something, I definitely don't really think about how it's necessarily going to look on the page, although uh, sometimes that does naturally flow and I'll try and when I'm typing it out or whatever I'll, I'll try and start spacing it out like that but uh, but a lot of those were more like when we were going through and doing the editing process and everything I was um, more sort of looking at things and going well some of these feel like they should be laid out a lot more differently and feel like they shouldn't just you know it doesn't necessarily feel like just a, a set a uh, standard poem sort of layout. It feels like it should be moved around a bit. And like, for example, the uh, the Andy Warhol one is very much spread out all over the place. I felt like um, the way that that flows sort of backwards and forwards across the page and everything felt more natural to the way that the poem is and, and the subject of the poem, where it, it, it doesn't feel like it should just be a regimented sort of layout it should be something a bit more sort of abstract i guess um and then that one uh, moving up where it's all like angled that one i mean like ria made a couple of suggestions when she was actually doing the the layout for it and stuff but there was certain ones where it was it, it just felt a bit more natural to move them around a bit on the page and and have uh something a bit more sort of disjointed or a bit more uh, striking as far as the the layout went, so it was yeah, it was definitely more in the editing process than in the writing process. Do you feel like there's anything that you would want to do with the text that you feel like software limits you to do? Not really that I came across as such. Although, have you read Lanny by Max Porter? No, no. Um, so that's a um, it's a very weird novel. Is it kind uh, of like House of Leaves? It, not really. No, it's sort of um, it's a very simple sort of story. But then there's these sections where you know, like the Green Man myth, where it's uh, sort of a it's, it's it's an ancient British sort of, uh, mythology thing where it's uh, a man made of a tree. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, it's usually just represent. It's a pagan thing, and it's it's usually just a, a face made of bark with leaves all around it. Yeah. Um, but there's um, so in this book, this uh, sort of green man, um, sort of figure is uh, almost stalking this entire town, and um, every time he's sort of on screen, so to speak, in the book. Um, you can hear voices from everyone in the town, and as it gets further and further through, the uh, the words curl around and overlap each other and stuff. So there's actual there's lines that actually like will curl around, and then other lines going through it of other people's thoughts and stuff. And I, I thought that was like a really interesting thing. Um, but at the same time, yeah, again, like a, a, it, it gets to a point where it's so overlapped that it actually becomes hard to read it and and everything i obviously didn't want to do that sort of i didn't want to make it so much like that uh especially with the first book but that was definitely something where i was like really intrigued by it and thought like that would be a really interesting thing to do yeah so. now in your book here and like 
going through the table of contents here. There are a, what what five different sections? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. What do the sections kind of represent to you? Were these like written in, or maybe like let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven sections. Like they kind of look like albums, you know, like were these set up this way, like on purpose, like, are they different periods of time or were you doing something where like you had the concept based off of the title of the section and then you wrote poems to that? No, it was more like when, uh, cause I've written a lot of this over the course of years. Um, and then, year? oh, yeah, about 20 years. Yeah. altogether. Um, and then, but obviously nothing that I wrote when I was like 14 or whatever actually like made it in there, like, you know, as, as it originally appeared sort of thing. I'd gone through, I, I'd managed to find all my old poetry and, and, uh, all this, and then I was writing stuff while we were putting the book together still and stuff like that. And then, um, I was trying to organize it in a way where it makes some sort of sense. Um, cause really I wanted it to be mainly about um struggling through depression and recovery so obviously the last chapter is pretty much to do with recovery from depression and um tries to be a bit more uplifting um the first chapter is to do with uh writing and um creativity and inspiration and stuff like that so it's like immortalized in ink is the name of the first chapter and it's um to, yeah like say mainly to do with like inspirations and and stuff like that then uh sounds of rebellion um that's mainly to do with um anger and politics and things like that then love and earn self-loathing is uh to do with relationships and heartbreak and stuff i guess and then uh of knowing other people friendships and sort of um betrayals and stuff like that the evil of the mind then is very much um to do with uh the, being in the depths of depression then friends of cruel endings is again like it, it's, it's more of an extension of uh, the evil of the mind i guess but there's um a lot of stuff in there that's about apology and sort of um the way depression makes you feel rather than you know, as a more external thing rather than just the actual feeling of depression. Uh, the evil of the mind is very much like what it feels like to be in the depths of depression. Friends of Cruel Endings then is more to do with um, how depression makes you come across to the outside world and and um, how it affects your relationships and things like that. And then it goes into the last chapter where it's, like say, recovery and uh, trying to move on and trying to be a bit more uplifting yeah uh, i don't know if that obviously like works in that way but that's the way i sort of tried to organize it so that it made so that it so that it sort of comes across as a bit of a journey is there um, a poem you'd like to read out of this um i'm happy to yeah um what, what's your favorite one out of here uh, I mean, I do have a few, um, cause obviously, I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of what I've done here not to be arrogant about it or anything like that. But, uh, yeah, there's, uh, some of these where you, you know, like when you're writing something and you just kind of go like, did that come out of me? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so I think when I'm writing and then like, I won't look at what I wrote for a few days and I'll go back and read it and I'll go, dude, this guy's fucking awesome. <laughs> what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> so i think like one of the ones that um I i'm really proud of is victor's abomination um uh, so this is in the first chapter where it's about things that have inspired me and things like that uh victor's abomination is actually uh sort of, sort of poetic retelling of frankenstein yeah born of curiosity and of arrogance and of sin called abomination oversized in failing skin i have done the world no wrong and i had never asked to live Yet the blame is all on me for the unwanted gifts you give. Only safe in hiding, seeking refuge from the cold, harsh frost, finding kinship in the worn-out pages of Milton's Paradise Lost, longing for some purpose and just wanting to belong, 
mistaken for a monster without the power to be strong. This Prometheus of modern times, but without the dedication, brought me into being, but was ashamed of his creation, abandoned me in fear, for he is both genius and a liar, inflicting life in spite of God, but denied the gift of fire. If you leave me cold and lonely without family or faction, I'll rob you of your brethren and come to blackmail you to action. Tragedy becomes us because we came from tragic starts, from loss and grief and longing, from unions torn apart. We both are bound by oaths of blood to fight against all takers because each of us is driven by the loss of our own makers. We will hunt each other down to seek redemption for the past until defeating death and nature has destroyed us both at last. Have you, do you, do you have an audio book of this? No, no, I don't. But uh, I was thinking of doing a similar thing to you did with um, with your book where you just basically read out the whole thing on um, your YouTube channel. Oh, um, shit, yeah, because like... So you, when you did the end of everything. Um, yeah. So I was thinking of maybe doing something like that. Dude, um, you have such a good fucking voice when you read, dude. I mean, <laughs> your, your voice sounds like your voice, but like you have like a, a tenor to it that matches like what you're reading about you know what i'm Mm. saying so where where is your book available uh well i published it through ingram spark so it means that like because i had to like go and buy isbns and everything you you actually should be able to go into any bookshop and order it and then it's available through any ebook uh site as well so i just wanted it to be widely available just uh, because it seemed like just as easy as uploading it just through Amazon or whatever. But just, you know, I thought like if I'm going to put in the work to do it, then it might as well just be available everywhere. Yeah. So one of the reasons that I started putting it together was um, when we first went into that uh, first lockdown and the first uh, wave of the pandemic. Obviously, one of the things that was uh, starting to become talked about quite a lot was uh, people struggling with their mental health and because it's something that I've struggled with my whole adult life I wanted to put something out there that I thought would be slightly helpful if possible to people even if it was just to show you know shine a bit of a light on mental health and stuff like that but also like just to let people know they're not alone hopefully I mean like from the feedback that I've got it does seem to have done that so that's that's obviously really great to hear but yeah, it's um, I've, I've I've had so much good feedback from it that I really just didn't expect. So I just you know I, it, that's definitely something that I'm really proud of and really want to kind of emphasize that that was the, the, my main motivation for doing it. Sort of thing was that just to let people know that you know they're not alone and that it, it's something that you know um, there are positives that can come out of the end of going through a depressive episode or or suffering um it's not something that you have to go through alone and it's not something that um that you should just kind of wallow in or uh allow it to defeat you it's it's something that can be fought and can as much as you might feel like uh it's all darkness when you're in the depths of it it's you know there are, there is a light at the end of the tunnel that kind of thing yeah so so what's next well, like I said, I've always been uh, writing short stories and stuff as well. I've been trying to write a novel. I wrote a short story that had quite a lot of good feedback uh, called In the Hanging Woods. So I'm ex- extending that into a novel at the moment. Unfortunately, I did hit another quite bad depressive episode shortly after releasing the book uh, for various other reasons. And uh, so I ended up stopping writing for... God, probably about 18 months. I was like off social media completely and things like that. But yeah, uh, I've got back into starting doing bits of things now. So hopefully I'll be able to get the book finished. uh, And I want to try and pull together a load of the short stories that I've written and try and release that as a collection as well. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully there might be another poetry collection coming out around around the beginning of next year or something like that. And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Instagram uh, at NP Hunt Writer. And then once my website's back up and running, that'll be NPHuntWriter.com. This is really good, man. It was good talking to you finally. That was rad, dude. Thanks for fucking hanging out with me, dude. Yeah, no worries, mate. Thanks very much. 
there you have it. That is my interview with N.P. Hunt. Make sure you run over to the link down below and pick up his book, Immortalized in Ink. If you dig fucking, like, again, like, Shel Silverstein, Edward Gorey, Tim Burton, all that fucking shit, you are going to fucking love this book. So go take a look at that um, and pick it up. And now for the motherfucking butt plugs. Go to my website, IHateMattWall.com. Sign up for my mailing list so you can get the 2021 um, yearbook of short stories and poems. Because once this month is over, that book is gonzo. Okay? And a new book will be there. And when you sign up and I put the new book up, you will get that too. So make sure you do that. Mentorship. If you need any mentoring... If you want to have an hour one-on-one -on -one with me where we set some fucking goals for your fucking career as a writer, as a poet, and start figuring out how to fucking hit those things. If you want to take yourself fucking serious and take this serious, you write me and let me know over at IHateMattWall at gmail.com or just go to IHateMattWall.com slash mentorship and you can see all there is I can do for you there. Um, Blood Rag issue five out now. And I am taking submissions <clears throat> for Blood Rag Issue 6. So if you have a poem, 14 lines or less, that you would like to have in the Blood Rag, send that over to me with the subject line, Submission Blood Rag. That's fine. You can pick up my books on Amazon, including the Poetic Anarchy anthologies. Like, uh-oh, uh-oh, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. This is scary. Okay, whew. Like this one here, Poetic Anarchy Volume 2. Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 is coming out super soon, and we're already putting together Poetic Anarchy Volume 4. I'm going to try to put these out at least twice a year. There, there might be a um, reason to do it more than that, but we're going to see how this sticks for right now, okay? So, but yeah, Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 has way more poets in it, way more stuff in it. It's just a bigger, better, better poetry book it's just like wrestlemania 3 coming at your face right there pontiac silverdome oh okay so anyway hoary woods over on kindle vela um my serial about uh low budget filmmaking my music is everywhere that you can stream music just search matt wall or search creeperson you'll be able to find it there oh and just so you know people ask this um the little song bumper i said this in an earlier podcast but that song is a song of mine called Hate Love Kill off of the second part of Goodbye Hope, which is called The Couple Named Emotional Instability. Um, you can find that song all over the place there. Um, so again, if you have any comments, any questions, anything like that, if you want to talk to me about any of these things, send me an email to IHateMattWall at gmail.com. If you want to be a guest on the show, send an email to IHateMattWall at gmail.com. And if you want me to come to wherever you are and do a workshop, like a, a Poetic Anarchy Crash Course or anything of that nature, you want me to talk to your group about writing, about poetry, about publishing, about anything, again, let me know at IHateMattWall at gmail.com. And be sure to... Just on a side note, since I never talk about it, if you go over to IHateMattWall.com and click merch, I got shirts, got tons of shirts, and I think there's hoodies as well. And if there's any kind of merchandise thing that you want that I do not have up there, let me know, and we will see what I could do about it. So with all that said, this video is John Holmes long. So we are going to cut this now. So remember guys, keep buying my books. Type hard, everybody, and I will talk to you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys, and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video, and if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.